I thought it might be interesting just to start with, um, just to try and build a bit of a relationship with you all. Um, you've had a bit of a biography on, on me, and I've had one <coughs> on you all as well, which you probably don't imagine. So when you get set up for this kind of thing, you're given a, a brief as to uh, what the audience comprises. And it, it tells me that you're all technically gifted, you're all clever, but you don't like to sit around very long because you get impatient. So I'll just have to sort of play that by ear. I think also what I might do is just tell you how I got the job. Uh, how did I end up working for Sir James Dyson? So, uh, I mean, I went to school um, to start with, and it was a part-time thing for me, really. I never really, uh, never really worked actually that well for me school. I didn't get on terribly well. Uh, the, the, I guess the teachers thought it was probably full-time, and I thought it was part-time, but never mind. It, it, it was all right for a bit. Um, I stayed on to do my A-levels um, for two reasons. I really fancied the girl in the lower sixth, um, and I'm pleased to say I'm married to her, and uh, 27 years later, so that was a great reason for staying. Uh, the second reason was I thought I had an outside chance of playing hockey for England, and uh, I didn't play for England, uh, but I got very close, so those weren't my only motives. Uh, I then went to Sirencester. I failed all my A levels, I went to Sirencester. Uh, <laughs> It, it was a long time ago. It's a, it was a Royal Agricultural College then. It's now much elevated, of course. Uh, but I went to Sirencester and uh, did okay. Um, uh, I can tell I did okay because I met the guy who came second on the course uh, only about three weeks ago, and uh, he reminded me of his bitterness uh, 27 years ago, apparently. Um, so then I worked for a farming company for a while, and that, that went well. Um, I ran a lot of farms in the south and southwest. I was the director of a large farming company. And then aged uh, 49 and a bit... Uh, somebody rang me up. The headhunters ring you up, don't they? And they say, um, you know, we've got this job. And I said, they're great, not interested. Uh, it's a really good job, still not interested. And just before they put the phone down, I said, unless it's James Dyson, then I might be interested. And uh, he said, it's James Dyson. So that was great. Um, now, you might think that this interview process is pretty straightforward, but yeah, you, you meet headhunters, and that's interesting for a bit, and then you meet the boss, and you think to yourself, okay, that's went gone pretty well, and he confirms you've got the job. What you don't realise, of course, is if, if you work in this sector, there is a third interview, and the third interview in my situation was, uh, I basically had to be allowed to come to Lincolnshire, okay? I'm a Yorkshireman, uh, I come from the southwest, and my interview was with Merrill Ward, Okay, so Merrill's here somewhere today, and um, it felt a bit like an interview, you know, what are you going to do here, Richard, and are you going to behave yourself, and uh, are you going to push the land, land value up more, that kind of stuff, you know how it works, the usual stuff, easier for me to mention this stuff than you, I thought. Um, so I had an, an extra interview with Merrill, and luckily she let me come to Lincolnshire, and that's how we, uh, we got on. The pig sector is, I thought it was sort of really innovative sector, and I come from the great unwashed of uh, those people who like receive support for what we do. Uh, so in that sense, but I thought you, I don't think you've actually been that brave with your targets, to be honest. Uh, whilst I was at school, I did read Brave New World, and um, I think actually uh, Brave New World, I'm supposed to talk about Brave New World, uh, Brave New World is 532 years after 2022. So I think whilst you've got a five-year horizon, I don't really expect you, me to go forward 532 years. Um, so uh, maybe not as ambitious as we thought. Okay, so I need to try and prove some credibility about pigs. Um, and this is just an idea to give you some idea of um, you know, our acreage and, and what we have in, in England. So I'll give you some numbers to this. So uh, just by the way, there is no relevance to which proportion of the pig it relates to which county. Okay? <laughs> just, it just happened how it was drawn. So we, we have about 33,000 acres of land uh, in the UK, 26,000 in Lincolnshire, 4,500 acres in Oxfordshire, and 2,500 acres in Gloucestershire. We grow all the normal crops that you would imagine. We have about 30,000 tonnes of wheat, about 10,000 tonnes of barley, about um, 100,000 tonnes of forage crops, which I'll talk more about in a moment, 5,000 tonnes of vining peas, and 5,000 tonnes of rape. So we grow all the sort of normal crops uh, that you would imagine. Uh, we also have a, a fledgling uh, sheep enterprise. We've got 8,000 sheep. Uh, and we also have just started a, a beef operation. So in terms of turnover, uh, this is how, what the business looks like. So again, the, the back end of the pig is farming. 
and that's roughly 66% of what we do, and that includes our basic payment. <coughs> we then have a good chunk, 28%, there or thereabouts, of our turnover, which relates to anaerobic digestion. We have five megawatts of, of AD, uh, and that's a good portion of our turnover. It's deliberate. It's about diversification of income. It's about um, actually making us better farmers. I take quite a lot of criticism, and I can see why. Uh, why, why, why are you growing crops uh, for AD, and why shouldn't it be growing food? And I've got two answers, really. The first one is, is what I'm not going to do is sit around and wait for the market to uh, support my cost of production. I, I have to do something about that. Nobody in this business is going to forgive me for just uh, waiting for, uh, to be a price taker. Least of all, James Dyson, as you can imagine. I think the other point is it actually genuinely makes us better farmers. So, you know, the old routine of, in, you know, if you're farming in East Anglia or you're farming in Lincolnshire, you know, what you do is in terms of cropping now in our days, you get up and you toss a coin and it's either wheat or rape. It's not that interesting, but it's, uh, you know, it's what those two crops which have actually made the money. But, you know, what it has led to is massive degradation of soils in the UK. This is very, very uh, public, public information. It's led to black grass on an epidemic level. It's led to unsustainability. And, and actually, if you look back at costs over the last 15 years, pretty well what it costs to uh, run, a, run a farm on a per acre basis, it now costs on a per hectare basis. So you know, the costs have literally gone up two and a half times in 15 years. Um, unsustainability is, uh, has, has happened on an epic scale. Lack of investment, most of the farms that we have been involved with have required drainage. So we've drained uh, almost 5,000 acres of land in the, in the last uh, four, and a, four and a bit years. Property, uh, as part of our business, it was really not what we were about to start with, but of course, if you do go ahead and you buy land, you come across property opportunities. And in that sense, we are uh, pickers of low fruit. So we don't set out to um, you know, um, exploit areas overtly, if you like. But where we've got sensitive opportunities to do so, we are doing that, and it's uh, providing us with some good incomes. Okay, so uh, what's all this about? Why has he put a telephone up there? This business is only five years old, and this is what it started off with, was with a telephone. Uh, everybody thinks, you know, uh, James Dyson, it must be complicated, it must be uh, all techy and whizzy. Actually, when you start a new business, you start off with an office, and you start off with a telephone, and you have to start and figure stuff out. And, of course, what we were doing at the, t at the time was... We, we've gone from zero acres to our current acreage in about five years. So, bluntly, stuff doesn't work to start off with. And, uh, and the first thing I would say is, you just have to get used to that. People are doing things that they were not previously qualified to do in a rapidly expanding business. The other important point at this, at this was to, to note when things were going wrong, but not to make a big deal about it. People do not need to be reminded of when things go wrong. You know, stating the bleeding obvious is really not that interesting. So in a developing business, things will go wrong, people will make mistakes. You've all heard, uh, all heard the statement, you know, what is it? Uh, I got it wrong a thousand times, but I actually never made a mistake. Okay, it's really, really important, uh, this. And, and what we could have easily done was to look at a lot of our uh, staff in particular and thought, actually, these guys are not yet qualified to do the job. And, of course, they weren't. But we were very honest about that. In terms of the basics of, well, the systems don't work, uh, the, the business is growing. And uh, what happens next is this. So the business grows, and what you end up doing is having a large farming business that operates just the same as a smaller farming business, except it's not usually as good, okay? People tend to think about, isn't it wonderful to have economies of scale? Not always. We have diseconomies of scale. We farm over a large area. Uh, we have a lot of traveling time. We, we get things wrong. We miscommunicate on occasions, and things go wrong. A lot different to, let's say, one man and a couple of guys on a farm. So we've got to try and figure out a way forward. And of course, nobody has done this before. You know, you can go to Ukraine and you can see large farming businesses. 
You can go to Russia, and you can go to America, but there isn't really a blueprint for large farming businesses. And remember, I've been in large farming for a long, long time. And what normally happens is, the farm gets to a certain size until the bloke can't manage it, or the lady can't manage it. That's how, how it works, isn't it? And then at that point, they get to, everybody then makes excuses because it's uh, human nature to do so. So you get to your 5,000 acres, your 6,000 acres, and you start to run out of puff, and you start to make a few uh, compromises, and you convince yourself it's all right, and then you find yourself that maybe that field hasn't done very well, and then that farm hasn't done very well, and then that region doesn't done very well, and suddenly actually you've got a big business very badly farmed. And we need to try and find a way to do, to do this. Innovation will actually drive this. You know, we have to find new ways of doing things. Last week, this is, this is beeswax, we fought, we're now five years on, we had a sort of bleating lady who came to me and said to me, we've actually run out of the ability to pay people. I said, you, well, I don't understand, what do you mean? She, we do, we're producing 18,000 invoices a, a year, we deal with 18,000 invoices a year, there isn't enough hours in the day to process it. So you can do a number of things there, I mean, we did have the money in the bank, by the way, you know, we, you know it was an issue for that. Uh, the, the, the issue then is what do you do about it? Do you say we need more people like you? Do we innovate? Do we figure something? And the reality is that's when you are compelled to innovate because if you don't, all you do is just building cost. And, and again, we were finding we were just overloading people. We had farm managers, for instance, who were managing 3,000 acres, suddenly managing 12,000 acres. And you've got assistant farm managers who, you know, don't know where they're going. And, Everybody thinks that it's all crazy and exciting and lots of testosterone, lots of diesel, and lots of you know, excitement. But actually, it's blooming frightening for those people in the business. And people think you know, responsibility is a great thing. But you also have to provide a framework to protect people. People need to know where their boundaries are. People need to know where their limits are. Other otherwise, they become disenfranchised uh, from the whole business. So is there a plan to all this? Yeah, yes, clearly there is. What I would like to say about strategy in particular, um, everybody seems to be waiting for, for something to happen, don't they? You know, I went to the NFU conference, and it was a great conference, but you know, I had people just harping on all the time about, wouldn't it be great to know what was going to happen? Uh, wouldn't it be great to have a plan? You know, how can we run our business without this kind of guidance from government? And actually, that's all right for a bit, but actually, I just don't buy it, if I'm, if I'm absolutely honest. So, you know, we, we've produced a strategy. Our strategy, uh, if well-written, should not really change that much. The pace of it will change, and of course, we'll have to make some, some amendments. But our strategy is X amount of land by uh, a certain time uh, in certain areas. Uh, we want to be uh, a force for good in agriculture, and we want to receive, uh, produce X return on capital and X uplifting land value. That's not actually that complicated. If we then come to the plan, th this is where I think you, you do need to make some, some estimations here. So as a member of the Great Unwashed, highly subsidized farming uh, part of the industry, what, am, what do I think? Number one question. Uh, do we actually think that the UK government will support us over time to the same degree as we are currently supported? My answer was no. So that's the first question answered. Second question, do I think that as a larger arable farmer, I will continue to receive proportionately the same amount of support as I do now? Do now. Second Again, a no in my mind. I don't know the answer to these. Remember, I'm making all this up. Next thing is, do I think that the support we get will be related to the area we farm or will it relate to public goods, delivery of? I think it will. It'll relate to delivery of public goods. You've, talk, you've heard about what the CLA are looking at. You've heard what the NFU are looking at. So to me, that sounds, that's good enough for me. So I've produced some nice graphs, which the people in the office have produced for me and they show that I'm going to be maybe getting half the amount of support I'm going to, going to do. I've, I've looked at the business and I've figured out realistically what amount of public good I think Beeswax Dyson delivers now, and I've produced myself a bit of a balance sheet. 
hey presto, there is a, a shortfall in income, and then I need to do something about it. So I really don't think it's, it's sort of, you know, um, politicians' place or we should all be just hanging around waiting for somebody to give us, a, give us a plan. The green bit is the tricky bit. This is what about execution. And I think in terms of how you execute the plan and implement the strategy, it is simplistically about the culture that you apply to your business. It's, people talk about, uh, is it management structure? Uh, is it uh, incentives? Is it rewards? Uh, is it target setting? But the culture overrides everything. And, and the culture we've tried to put in, in place is, is one of honesty. So we are very honest with, with everybody. We forgive mistakes. You know, the idea of, you know, a young guy making a mistake and instantly putting him back, his back in his box, because that's good character building stuff, not that interesting as far as I'm concerned. I, re I remember working for a, 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 a very nice, in fact, not so nice man in uh, North Yorkshire, where I was brought up, and of course, they would argue it was good character building stuff. Utter rubbish. I think it was about uh, trying to destroy people's character. I think it was about trying to intimidate young people. And I wasn't intimidated, in, intimidated then, you won't be surprised to hear. I'm certainly not going to find any of our staff intimidating young people in the business now. So culture overrides everything we do. Management structure, of course, is important. Management development, getting our managers out of the sector, getting them out of the industry to look at other, other areas. I think the other thing that's, in, that's interesting for me is you know, the power of, of capital. In, a, in, an, in an era and in an industry where capital has been short, any investment in capital, in new equipment, whether it's fixed equipment or whether it's um, technology, the payback on that capital is very significant in my mind. As owners of land, our return on capital is actually inherently low, but our return on working capital is pretty high. And in that sense, I'm encouraged to keep investing uh, in working capital to push up overall returns. Um, this is what I saw when I looked in the mirror one day. Okay, it's a sheep. Okay, for you pig farmers, I don't know what kind of sheep it is. I think it might be one of our sheep, actually. And what I thought was, um, I'd been in the job about a year or so, and I thought, actually, is this working out as I, as I expected? You know, what, what, have we got things right and have we got things wrong? And I felt there was a danger we were going to be pulled along uh, like the rest of the industry. So you've heard Theresa May say that, you know, we, she just doesn't want a bad deal, she'd rather have no deal. Now, she obviously invented that, I didn't. But what I felt was that, that as a large organisation that was well-funded uh, with some opportunities to invest, I just didn't want to uh, follow um, the rest of the industry. And in that sense, I was determined to be, to, to be different. What I should say as well is that uh, if we look at um, people selling grain at the moment, I know you all buy grain, and, and this, is, this is a classic farmer sheep mentality. Grain, uh, the Arable farmers last year sold grain forward uh, at decent prices, the market went up, oh dear, that was suddenly a bad decision. Today we have opportunities to sell wheat at 20 pound a tonne over the cost of production. How much, how much is a UK farmer sold at the moment? 15%. Okay, so it was a binary choice for the farmers. Yeah, they, they could either sell or not sell. It's no more complicated than that. Okay, we could argue about semantics and percentages. But actually, um, the idea of doing what everybody else has done just didn't appeal to me because all we'd end up being is a big version of everybody else. And I've said already, big versions of small farms are not profitable and not successful. Okay, so this is what, this is what our industry, this is what my industry looks like. And um, the, 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 yeah, there's people you recognize here, and there's absolutely, of course, you know, no, um, not, nothing disparaging, I mean, in, in putting up the names here. My point is this is that there's sort of five people beeswax can sell stuff to. There's sort of five people we can buy stuff from. And there's five people that make stuff. 
and there's 167,000 of us. Now, I know there's probably 55,000 of us make the decisions, but never mind, I've got to take the stats from somewhere. The point's the same, however. So we have seen at all levels around us considerable amounts of consolidation. We've seen costs uh, driven out, we've seen efficiency, and we've seen control. And my point is really, is you know, how much control does, does the farm have? Is this a model which is sustainable? Try buying fertilizer as an arable farmer any other week apart from at cereals. Okay, how ludicrous is that? You see a, a good price for urea two or three months in advance of when the market normally opens and you can't buy it. Try buying a combine in any other month apart from October. It's not actually that straightforward. So my point is, you know, have people got their hands, hands tied? The other point of this, of this slide as well is, you know, are you uh, and are we, the industry, tying the hands of the people who work for us? You know, do we genuinely value the people? It's a great cliche, isn't it? People is our greatest asset. Do you think people really mean that? I'm not so convinced about that, if I'm absolutely honest. And I think freeing up what I call free management, you know, we have guys on our farms and, and ladies who are working for us who have, you know, implicit knowledge of what we're going to do. My job is to effectively extract that knowledge from them. So, another really sort of interesting slide. Post-Brexit, what's, what's, what's going to happen? So I've already said that I think we will get a, a, you know, a, good less, a good bit less support than we have already. I think that will inevitably make us more market focused. In, in simple terms, what we've lost on the swings we've gained on the roundabouts so far. So if I deduct the amount of uh, the reduction in support I get from the, the UK government and I alter the value of sterling, I'm broadly neutral. But broadly neutral wasn't very exciting because we weren't making any money in the first place anyway. So inevitably we will need to look for uh, opportunities to um, leverage our capital and also to try and offer a unique opportunity to our customers going forward. And for an arable farmer to say customer is, is, is not that easy, you know, customer. Just doesn't roll off the tongue very well for me. For you all, of course, it rolls off the tongue extremely well. But an arable farmer is not used to having customers, okay? Who invites an arable farmer to, to an event? You know, the people that supply him and the people that he supplies to. How bizarre is that if you think about it? Who, where's the dynamic and where's the power? So we, we'll need to look at unique offerings. We'll need to look at scale. We, will, we beeswax will need to invest further up the value chain. That, that is for certain. We'll need to be in a situation where we can offer solutions to things. And I, and I just uh, remind you about what, what, what currently happens, you know, when you go and buy a pair of trousers or a new dress. Currently, how it happens. You know, historically, you'd have gone into the shop and you'd have sort of, you know, been a bit uncomfortable if you'd chap like me and, you know, you didn't really want to try the trousers on because you, you, you knew you were 38, but really you wanted to be a 36. You know, that's how it worked, wasn't it? So what you can do now is you can save all that embarrassment and you can shop online. But what they do now is, if I order a pair of um, blue chinos, because that's what we all wear, don't we? Uh, blue chinos. They send me a pair of uh, 38s. They send me a pair of 36s. They also send me a pair of black ones and a pair of cream ones as well, don't they? That's how it works. Because actually, they sort of know how I work. This, I this idea of discoverability is something that we, I think, will have to get used to. I've started sending information to some of our customers. Uh, and uh, they're saying, well, why do you send all these pictures of these potatoes growing? I said, well, I thought you might be interested in them. No, we're not. Oh, okay, well, that's not a good start, isn't it? Um, okay, well, I'll send you a whole lot of pictures of us planting potatoes, you know, and, you know, yeah, we've got these videos, Richard, you know, yeah, not that interesting, really. Oh, I thought it would be. I then send him a picture of um, uh, marsh harriers nesting, and the phone goes off the hook, and they say, Richard, do you realise that marsh harriers are rarer than golden eagles? Well, I didn't. So I said, you're now interested in this. 
And they said, um, yeah, of course, it's absolutely wonderful. We want to talk about this. I said, are you going to pay for it? And they said, well, oh, no, we haven't quite got there. The point is, this is a sort of infantile relationship, and that's an infantile story. But I don't really yet know what my customers want. But if I keep actually bombarding them with, they may discover what they want from me, and it may have value. That, that's my hope. So, I need to try and build a market. I've talked a little bit about, you know, let, let's say how Amazon work, and I've talked about Uber, and I've talked about online shopping, which is all, all great stuff. Hopefully we can uh, combine volume with a, a, a quality offer. Uh, that's what I'm trying to do. And I'm aiming to actually invest, as I've said, further up the value chain to try and uh, extract some value and use my capital to do that. Uh, this is now on Amber, and it says I've got four minutes and ten seconds, nine seconds, eight seconds for questions. So thank you very much.